thank to all of you for coming here um, to spend an hour learning about an area of science I'm passionate about, and that's the uh, genomics in particular. Um, for those of you who are not familiar or you want to learn more about the National Human Genome Research Institute, we have a, a, a folder outside on the table. Please pick one up. It has some one-pagers and some additional material about our institute. We are one of the 27 institutes and centers that makes up the, the U.S.'s National Institutes of Health. Uh, we are the institute that is designated for leading genomics research in the United States. And that's, that's what I want to tell you about. I've actually been at the Institute now for just over 25 years, and I've been the director for nearly 10 years. Uh, but I've been involved in the field of genomics, actually, from the very beginning. So what I, of the field. And what I wanted to do today, really, is to provide you a very broad overview and an update about what's going on in genomics, and in very much what you will hear about is a series, you could tell from the title, of journeys, if you will. Because there are a series of journeys that we are in the middle of that are really moving us uh, from a point of having barely any substantive information about our fundamental blueprint that operates the human body to actually being in a position where we will be able to, and we are advancing human health through advancing knowledge about our blueprint, that is, our genome. So what I'm going to do today is really cover three things, three broad areas. I'm going to give you a historic review of the first three decades of this field of genomics. It's going to be a very celebratory thing. I'm going to brag a lot about what remarkable things we've done in genomics over the first three decades. But I'm then going to move and talk about sort of what's going on now. What's the focus of our attention? What are the things I worry about as the director of the NIH Institute responsible for genomics? And I'm going to tell you about some new realities we're facing, but the realities also bring some very important opportunities that we are pursuing. And that'll be sort of the present. And then the third thing I'm going to talk about is what we are doing to plan for the future. And in particular, we're in the middle of a strategic planning process that will yield a new strategic vision for this field of genomics uh, beginning in 2020. And I'll briefly tell you about that. So let me just start with um, some history and some review of what's been accomplished. But I really need to, recognizing our, and expecting a highly diverse audience in terms of knowledge about genomics, I just want to spend one minute giving you a very rapid review of what is a genome and what are we talking about and what do I mean by blueprint and so forth. So just some real simple basics. Uh, you know, you think about the human body, for example, several tens of trillions of cells um, exist in the human body and make up the human body. It actually turns out that every one of those cells operates using the identical blueprint for making the cell and for, for operating the functions of the cell. And we know and we've learned over the years that that, nucle that, the, that blueprint is actually stored in the middle of the cell in a structure called a nucleus. It's actually housed in these things called chromosomes, which think of them as suitcases that carry this blueprint, if you will, from cell to cell, generation to generation. But the real molecule you should be thinking about, because it's really where all the action is, is this molecule of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And, you know, there's a lot that we've learned about DNA since its original discovery many, many, many years ago. But the only basics that you need to remember about DNA is that it consists of four building blocks, four chemicals. And we actually keep it simple. We actually abbreviate it just by the first letter of those building blocks. So we talk about G's, A's, T's, and C's. And you can see the chemicals there. It is the order of these nucleotides, of these bases, of these letters, the G, A, T, C, 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 is that order that basically encodes all the information necessary for biological systems to be formed and then to operate. All of the DNA of an organism, all the DNA that each of your cells contains within it is called a genome. That's the name for all your basic blueprint, your DNA blueprint. And it actually turns out that it's a big number when you say how many letters make up all of the human genome. It's a big number, but it is a finite number. The number is about three billion. So basically, you operate based on the order of three billion G's, A's, T's, and C's that uniquely reflects your blueprint. That is the genome. Well, what's transpired? Well, what's transpired starting in the 1950s in particular when that famous double helical structure of DNA was discovered and then accelerating in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s was we got better and better and better and better at studying DNA in the laboratory. We actually even got to the point where we could isolate the DNA and we can actually read out the letters, the G's, A's, T's, and C's, basically decoding the, the DNA of any organism, including humans. And then everything was getting so efficient that we recognized by the late 1980s that maybe, maybe we could tackle the complete analysis 
of an organism's DNA. In other words, its entire genome. And this notion got so exciting that a field was created, the field of genomics. It's a young field. It only came into being in 1987. In fact, the first use of the word genomics did not appear in the scientific or medical literature until this lead editorial of a brand new journal that was established called Genomics, where the word was coined and first put into the scientific and medical literature. Why was it that a new field was created, and why was it that there was so much excitement around this idea of being comprehensive in studying all the DNA of an organism and thinking about actually tackling something on a scale of the entire human genome? And it was basically galvanized by a project very nicely supported by the U.S. Congress, but international in scope and scale, something called the Human Genome Project. Now, looking around the room and predicting many of your ages, this is stuff you read about in the history books. I was very fortunate. I was perfectly poised to participate in this project on day one. I had just graduated with an MD-PhD degree a couple years earlier. I was studying in a laboratory, learning some valuable techniques to use in genomics. And I just got to be in the right place at the right time, and I joined the project from the very beginning when it started in 1990. It was an incredible project in every, by any dimension. It was very unusual. It was international. It was big and audacious. By the way, that's goal. Read out the three billion letters of the human genome. Basically decode the human blueprint for the very first time. It wasn't just the U.S. It wasn't just the National Institutes of Health. It was multiple funders around the world, multiple countries. And it was all very organized in a very big consortium team science uh, fashion. Something very unlike the way science was done back in the 1990s. But it worked. And it was incredibly successful. And 13 years after it began, in 2003, now 16 years ago, uh, the project was completed. So that's all I'm going to tell you about the Human Genome Project. But we, 16 years ago, basically had in front of us, for the very first time ever, the order of the three billion letters that make up the human blueprint, all the human genome. So to celebrate, let me just point out, if I was going to try to very quickly go through sort of the major highlights of this first three decades, because it's been just about a little over three decades of this field of genomics, what would those six highlights look like that we deserve and we should celebrate? Well, I already told you about the first one. I mean, we did it. The first goal of the field of genomics was read out the human genome sequence for the very first time, do it in the Human Genome Project, done, 16 years ago. Well, what happened 16 years ago, there were a lot of people like me, still fairly young, still really excited about genomics, and we had just basically accomplished the thing we never thought was going to necessarily be so easy to accomplish. And it was very obvious that we had a lot still to do, even though we celebrated the completion of the Human Genome Project. And at the National Institutes of Health, it was pretty obvious what needed to be done. Even if we didn't think about it, well, the scientific literature and the, and the, and the news media covered it pretty clearly. It was very obvious that having in hand the blueprint of the human genome, the blueprint of humans in the form of the sequence of the human genome gave opportunities to use genomics to change the way we practice medicine. And you can see in the New York Times or in Science Magazine sort of immediately featuring this idea of genomic medicine. Now, by genomic medicine, what we mean um, is at the time, to be honest with you, was, was, was probably looked a little like this. It was sort of conceptualized, it was a little bit blurry. Uh, we had a general idea of what we wanted to do. And I can tell you from my years when I trained in, in, was in medical school up until 1987, everything I was taught about the practice of medicine was based on the best thing you can do for the average patient. Because that's basically the way medicine is practiced up until now. But none of us is necessarily average. Each of us is a teeny bit different. And one of the ways that we're a teeny bit different is each of us has slightly different blueprint. Most of our blueprints are the same, but there's few differences. And wouldn't it be great if we can tailor medicine not to the average patient, but to, to the specific patient sitting in front of you, having information about their specific genome, their specific set of three billion letters. And so the notion of genomic medicine, as it got clearer and clearer, was really having a new medical discipline start to emerge that would allow us to not treat patients based on the average way of treating them, but to use information about their unique genome to tailor their medical and clinical care and think about the implications of that. And what I would tell you is that began the sort of the second phase of this genomics journey. The first phase was the genome project. Second phase was how are we ever going to implement genomic medicine? How are we going to make that a reality? Well, the past 16 years have seen a number of wonderful things that were going to absolutely be needed. 
Any one of these I could spend an hour on, I'm gonna spend three minutes on, but you'll get a general appreciation of the steps that have been needed since the Genome Project ended to get us closer and closer to realizing genomic medicine. First thing I can tell you was that we needed to get much more efficient at reading out DNA's letters. It was called sequencing DNA in the laboratory. And the reason why is because the Human Genome Project delivered its first sequence of the human genome, but it cost about a billion dollars to generate that. It was good, good, great use of money and inc incredibly catalytic in what it did to the field, but that was not gonna be what you could do for a typical patient that walks into your clinic. Not a, million do a billion dollar test. But the good news is in the last 16 years, catalyzed by, by a research program uh, that we have at, had at our institute, but also the private sector's contribution to this, we have now seen the cost of sequencing a human genome reduced by one million fold. We can now sequence any one of your genomes for less than $1,000. 16 years ago, it cost a billion dollars. Truly remarkable, and it's completely changed everything. Among the things that has changed, in addition to the idea of actually being able to do this in the clinic, and you can actually be able to afford it about the cost of an MRI these days, it also meant that we weren't going to just sit around and have one human genome sequence. We were interested in having a lot of people's genome sequences. Why? Because we want to know how people differ, and we want to know when those differences in their sequence give some information to practicing physicians to better care for the patient. If you want to know a number, by and large, compared to the person sitting next to you, about one out of a thousand letters in your genome is different compared to the person sitting next to you. You're 99.9% .9 identical to the person sitting next to you, but one out of a thousand across three billion letters is about three to five million places, letters in your genome that are different compared to the person sitting next to you. And we wanted to have understanding of what those differences were, because it turns out that most of those differences are fairly common in the human population. One way to accomplish it, sequence a lot of people's genomes. 16 years ago, we had one human genome sequence. Today, we have hundreds of thousands. I predict I'll be able to change this slide in the coming year or two to probably well over a million people across the planet will have had their genome sequenced and have that data available to scientists to basically put up on the internet in terms of where the, what differences there are, we call them variants, but what spelling differences people have because then scientists can study those variants and figure out which ones are medically important, which ones are not medically important. In order to do that, you need to know when you have a spelling difference, you need to know does that spelling difference in a genome actually change the way the genome works? Does it change the information it encodes? For that, you need to understand how the human genome actually works. And here we've had 16 years to interpret those three billion letters. We've gone from knowing about this much, about how the human genome works, to maybe knowing about this much. We ultimately need to know this much. You get the idea. We are still early on and fully interpreting all of this, the mystery of these three billion letters and all the information and codes. Where are the genes? How are the genes turned on and off in different cells at different times, et cetera? But we've made substantial advances in 16 years. And again, I could talk about this for an hour, but I'm not going to, just needless to say, we're 16 years into this journey of understanding how these three billion letters actually do what they do. And we've made great advances, but many more to come. Being able to sequence genomes cheaply, being able to find out who has variants in their genome at different places compared to other people, and then being able to know what the implications of those differences are in people's genomes have allowed us to now also do something we always wanted to do, which is to begin to make correlations between certain genetic differences and whether or not people get a particular disease. Almost all diseases have a genetic influence, if not an overt genetic uh, cause. And what we have now done in this 16 years in particular has made significant advances in unraveling the genomic basis of human disease. And I'm sure you hear about this a lot because the popular press covers this as they should because it has been remarkable in some areas what has happened. What are the things you've heard the most about? You've probably heard the most about cancer because it turns out that cancer is basically a disease of the genome where cells have picked up a bunch of changes in your body and it made those cells grow out of control, so it's cancer. But we now have the ability to take that cancer specimen and read all of its DNA, read all of its genome, and learn a lot about the cancer. Maybe some of the things driving the cancer, some of the best ways to treat the cancer, and so forth. So the whole field of cancer research has been turned upside down in a very positive way because of genomics. The other thing you've probably heard a lot about because of the successes is in rare genetic diseases. 
Now, these are diseases that you've probably heard of, like sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease. These are rare in the population, but turns out they're relatively simple at a genomic level, because in all cases, it's almost always uh, spelling differences, variants in a patient's genome that basically breaks one of the 20,000 genes in the genome. We have 20,000 genes, you get a mutation in it, a variant in it, it breaks the gene, you get the disease. I'll give you a number to show you how remarkable our advances have been there. When the Genome Project began in 1990, there were 61, 61 rare diseases. We knew what was causing that disease. We knew what was broken in the genome. Today, fast forward, especially what's happened over the last seven, eight years, over 5,200 rare diseases, we know exactly what is wrong with those patients in terms of what is broken in the genome, 61 to 5,200. So that's why we've made significant advances in cancer and rare diseases. The significant advances to come in the future will relate more to more common diseases like hypertension and diabetes and Alzheimer's and autism and so forth. These are not simple at a genomic level. It's not one gene. It's multiple different spelling differences that somehow together influence whether you're at risk for the disease or not. And we have made some strides, but we'll, the big strides are going to come over the next 10 years. So again, significant advances, many more to come, but enough to celebrate. And then the sixth highlight, which in some ways I find the most gratifying because I never anticipated it was going to happen as quickly as it has, is that we have begun to see vivid examples of genomic medicine, the actual practice of medicine, change because of genomics. And what we have gone from 16 years ago was a view like this to now, particularly over the last five to eight years, have begun to see this come into focus in a way that we now can begin to appreciate how genomics truly is going to influence medicine in the future. Again, I, I don't have time to talk about these in great detail, but just to give you a few highlights, what are the kinds of areas of medicine and medical practice that genomics really is being used? Well, I hinted at one, cancer. Cancer is absolutely going to be the number one application of genomic medicine in the coming probably 20, 30 years because it has such potential to change the way cancer patients are managed. So expect to see that. And you actually see it, advertisements on the television or in newspapers. All cancer centers now talk about their cancer genomics programs because it is absolutely the state of the art. Pharmacogenomics, big word, just pharmacology and genomics. Why is it that all the medicines that are offered at pharmacies um, are perfectly fine? They're all approved. They're all good to be used. But a lot of people don't respond well to them, or they respond poorly, or they don't respond at all. The reason is that all of us have slightly different variants in the part of our genome that influence how drugs are metabolized. And it turns out that that makes some of us good responders or bad responders to different medications. Up until now, clinicians have been blind to that. They just treat the average patient, right? They give them medicine. If it doesn't work, they give them another medicine. There's a better way. And the better way is to first get genomic information and figure out based on the unique genomic information of a patient whether it's better off giving them this medicine or this medicine or this medicine. Used to be science fiction. It is now here and now. More and more medications you'll be hearing about where pharmacogenomic, pharmacogenomic information will be recommended prior to giving out a medication. I already hinted at this, the idea that for rare genetic diseases um, where genomics has had a great impact, it's also had a great impact clinically. Nowadays, when you have a patient in front of you who you simply do not know what is wrong with that patient, they seem to have a rare disease, you sequence their genome. It's cheaper than the kind of other kind of workups you would typically do, and the yields are getting better and better and higher and higher. And now literally, in the United States alone, literally hundreds of patients with rare diseases every month are getting their genome sequenced. And once upon a time, that was totally hypothetical it would, would work, and now it's routine. And increasingly, we're getting insurance companies be willing to pay for this um, because it's becoming part of the, the, the mainstream of medicine. And lastly, as my last of four examples, and there are others I could cite, the last one relates to prenatal genomic testing. Uh, prenatal genetic testing has been going on for, for decades um, here and in other countries, but it has typically involved needing to get access to fetal DNA through invasive procedures like amniocentesis. But now it actually turns out genomic technologies that have been developed and now have been commercialized on a very large scale around the world utilize the high sensitivity these methods have so that they can detect very teeny amounts of fetal DNA that naturally gets shed from the placenta and float around in, moms, in the pregnant mom's bloodstream. So now instead of invasive methods, you do a simple blood draw 
and you could basically screen that unborn child for all the same things that you would screen them for, if, but, with that, when, but you don't have to go and do anything invasive to access the fetal DNA. This is called non-invasive genetic testing or genomic testing. And it is absolutely the number one application of genomic medicine. There are predicted to be 10 million pregnant women around the world this year who will get this genomic test done. And, and whereas it wasn't even available, I think, about eight years ago. So this has been very gratifying to see a complete change in the practice of prenatal care uh, through genomics. So those are the six celebratory things I wanted to tell you about uh, genomics. Um, and, uh, but I wanted to now take you to the present tense and to really uh, tell you about some of the things that we are really grappling with, um, in, at, at, especially at the National Human Genome Research Institute. And I, I, I hope you've got a sense from these first 20 minutes or so that I'm extremely enthusiastic. I think genomics is fantastic. It's, uh, it's uh, just, just, it's incredibly gratifying to be involved in the field. But at the same time, I am realistic. And I wanted to sort of share with you, what do I worry about as the director of an NIH institute responsible for this field? So this is just making it real, is what I would say. I'm going to tell you about five realities, but each one of them are associated with opportunities. And in fact, almost all these realities reflect the fact that we've been so successful in genomics that it brings new challenges that we are grappling with that are really important. So new reality and opportunity number one. As I mentioned, it is really very straightforward. In fact, it is almost trivial to generate a genome sequence of a person. I could take any one of you. I wouldn't even have to do a blood draw. I could just get a little bit of your saliva. And within about two days, we could have a complete sequence of your genome. That, and it wouldn't even cost that much. That is trivial. But I don't want to leave you with this idea that when we actually look on the computer and we look at all the letters of your genome, we instantly know what every one of your variants means when we have your list of three to five million variants. Not the case. We can get the data, but right now we can't quite interpret it as well as we need to. And in fact, when we do this to patients, when we actually go and round on those patients in the morning and look at their three to five million spelling differences in their genome, we feel like this. Like most of them, we have no idea what they mean. So actually, clinically understanding a patient's genome sequence is not trivial. It needs to become trivial. It needs to be a simple lookup on a little iPad or an iPhone or something so that a busy healthcare professional, whether it be a nurse or a pharmacist or a physician or a physician assistant, will have the information they need and immediately know what it means. And we have a huge gap right now, and we have major research programs at our institute and elsewhere around the world to try to close that gap. It's actually a lot of scientific literature helping us, but, but we need to get this into a much more synthetic, user-friendly form so that it becomes trivial to interpret a genome sequence of a patient before you round on them. So that's one of our grand challenges. It's a great opportunity and terrific research going on to try to support that. New reality and opportunity number two really reflects, again, we're victims of our own success because we've become relevant. You know, when you're sort of a scientific discipline and you're not broadly relevant, it's just sort of easy and sort of fun. This is what it was like when I got involved in genomics during the Human Genome Project. It was just a bunch of scientists like me, a bunch of geeks in a laboratory, working at the bench, working at the computer. It was just us. We, all we had to do was figure out the sequence of the human genome. Sixteen years ago, when we finished the Genome Project, it started to, we got excited. We said, hey, there's going to be some medical applications. Hey, healthcare professionals, come join our field. Help us figure out how to realize genomic medicine. It was still fun, although we started to realize, wow, when we start dealing with the medical professionals, it gets more complicated than just working in the laboratory, because now you have to sort of deal with medicine. But then what happens? Well, what happens over the past few years, half decade in particular, is genomic medicine is being realized. It, it affects, it's relevant to cancer patients. It's relevant to patients who are getting medications. It's relevant to pregnant couples thinking about prenatal testing. It's relevant to families who have patients or family members who have rare diseases who are getting their genome sequenced. All of a sudden, genomics is becoming relevant to patients. And once you're relevant to patients, you're relevant to all the people that, are, that, are, that surround patients, which means everybody. All of a sudden, you're relevant to society. And we've now touched healthcare. I don't need to stand, I, and you come to Capitol Hill and you say, healthcare, you know it's complicated. And we know it's complicated and it's become very real to us. We are now in the midst of creating significant changes to the healthcare ecosystem, something that we know already is politically complicated, but it, I can tell you, it's also scientifically complicated. And from a societal point of view, it's very complicated. 
So for a, a field that mostly was just having fun doing science, now all of a sudden we're thinking more broadly about society. Now, to be fair, actually we've always been thinking about society. In fact, we've had a program associated with genomics since the beginning of the Human Genome Project. So going back to 1990, called the Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Research Program, or the LC Research Program. We actually spend 5% of our research dollars on our LC Research Program, and it is this, so incredibly smart that we've been doing it. Again, the U.S. Congress has been very supportive of it and encouraging us to do this from the beginning of the field, and it has helped us left and right and will continue to. But if anything, it's gotten more important than ever. Just think about all the issues about, about understanding genomics, whether it's the patient trying to understand genomics or whether it's the healthcare professionals trying to keep up with these rapid advances and making sure they communicate this information to the patient. So genomic literacy is a very important societal issue we think a lot about now. Thinking about how all, all this is going to get paid for, that's always an issue in healthcare and dealing a lot to try to educate the payers about genomic advances and what should become standard of care. Thinking about making sure there's appropriate oversight. We work a lot with the FDA and thinking a lot about how to properly make sure that genomic testing is appropriately, is, is, is regulated and appropriately looked after. And of course, there's many issues, and I wouldn't be surprised if questions come up related to privacy, like a lot of very personal, you can't get much more intimately personal than your blueprint. And of course, there's a lot of issues around medical information privacy as it is, and it only becomes uh, incredibly important when you think about genomic information. So there are those issues and other issues. It's something we don't just think about and try to help with. We try to research these issues at the Institute to try to help inform policy discussions so that there's data behind some of the ideas that, um, that we are coming up with to help with some of the recommendations. Reality number three, new reality and opportunity. And here, I have to admit, um, it's an area that we have not been doing well, and I promise you we will be doing better. And actually, and I'm not trying to hide from this because I think we shouldn't hide from this. We, we have a, a, a small problem, maybe even a big problem, in genomic studies in that it has been insufficient in, in terms of its diversity, ancestral diversity. Uh, this actually came up and uh, it was starting to be recognized in some of the big genetic and genomic studies going on in 2009 uh, by some people who were sort of looking after what was sort of the distribution of, of individuals who were participating in genomics research. And they updated this in 2016 with the hope that they'd report that things got better. Um, and they sort of got better, but they didn't get adequately better. And in particular, what um, the real punchline here is back in 2009, if you looked at all the individuals who are part of major genetics and genomic studies, 96% of them were of European ancestry. And only about 4%, as you can see, were of non-European ancestry. And seven years, it's, at first, looks like it got better. It was only 81% European ancestry, and it looked like it got up to 19%. You actually have to dig a little deeper to recognize that it wasn't getting as, as, as good as it should be getting. In particular, while yes, there was a five-fold increase in non-European samples being studied um, in genomic studies, it turns out that 78% of that increase came from populations of Asian ancestry, in part because of the extensive amount of genomic research being done um, in Asia. And therefore, when you looked at some of the other ancestral populations, in particular African Americans or um, individuals of Latin American descent, it still made up less than 4%. This is not a reflection of what our population is. It is heavily, still heavily skewed to individuals of European ancestry. Another study from this year sort of really pointed that out. If you just look at the top panel, this is sort of the rising number of individuals that are participating in genomics research, which is great that we're getting large numbers. But then look at the population demographics, and you can see that the greatest growth is in the red, which are people of European uh, um, uh, ancestry, and the other colors you can see sort of following below. And it, Shown on the right in particular, the far right, that's the general population distribution. And you can see it by no means reflects what's going on in genomics research. And those, you give the numbers on top, the percentages on the bottom. Either way, we don't get a very good grade. We are simply falling short of having genomics research being performed on individuals that represent the distribution of people um, in the United States or in the world. What I can tell you is we recognize this problem. We are committed to changing it. This is a, a perspective piece that we wrote that summarized sort of what, how we were going to change our priorities uh, that we published last year. And there's a number of things that we are doing in our studies. And what I would tell you more than anything is to, is to basically require a greater enrichment of individuals who have come from underrepresented groups in genomics research. And we hope to be moving the needle in the coming years. And 
the good news is there's other parts of NIH are recognizing this as well and are helping in some of the studies they are doing to also move the needle. So that's an area I promise you improvement in the coming years. New reality and opportunity number four, I can tell you is an actually interest, it's, it's again success, but then it makes me a little uneasy because all of a sudden as the head of a funding agency that can actually control a lot of things because we're involved in funding, I'm about to lose some control here because of our success of, of genomics being taken up in medicine. And in particular, this is basically um, a, a, a study that was done by an organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that basically looked on the trends going on internationally and said, what are the major changes in the generation of human genome sequence? Who's generating sequences? It turns out that healthcare back in 2012 was only generating 1%, even today or last year, only 20%. But by 2022, and that won't be too long until we're in 2022, over 80% of genomic data, of genome sequence data, will be generated not by people that I'm funding to do research, but rather by the healthcare systems. Now, the good news, and this is sort of the actual paper and some of the data, the good news is that by about 2022, we're going to have 40 to 50 million people will have had their genome sequenced. It's projected, most of that by healthcare. But as was written about in this forum, it's really interesting because the ongoing, as it's the quote from you and Bernie, the ongoing adoption of genomic medicine means that some of the most fundamental data types in molecular biology, that is genomic sequencing and other genomic assays, are being paid for and organized at scale by healthcare. Now, why do I worry about that a little? Well, it's not that I'm a control freak, but as a funder, it meant that I could sort of help control how that genomic data was being generated and what people were being studied, how that data was being handled afterwards, it was all part of getting a grant from, the, from our institute. But, but if all of a sudden most of that data is being generated by healthcare, we're in a whole different realm. There's no guarantee that data is going to be available to scientists, although we're working to hopefully make sure it is. There's no guarantee who's going to actually be getting those genome, that genomic studies done. It's going to be patients as part of healthcare systems. And so this is just sort of a very different kind of circumstance where we're going to have to position ourselves to take advantage of this in a fashion that we can't totally control it. Oh, and by the way, think about what I was just telling you about with diversity. If all of a sudden most of the genomic data is being generated by healthcare, is healthcare equally accessible across all demographics in the U.S. or around the world? Well, no, of course not. So all of a sudden, diverse communities may face barriers to accessing genomic medicine, and this risks exacerbating the diversity problem. Because I can't even influence that. Now it's going to be influenced by what individuals get access to cutting edge medicine that includes genomic medicine. And so again, this is something we are paying attention to, we are trying to influence, but it is a reality we need to be dealing with that the bulk of genomic data in the future will be generated by healthcare, not through research organizations funded by funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health. Last reality, um, this is more of a fun reality, um, uh, but, and it's an exciting one that I know many people have heard about and will increasingly hear about. And it basically is an admission that I will make, because I've spent the, most of the time here talking about genetics, 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 and genomics. I will have to admit, it is true, that that it's not all about genomics, and it's not all about genetics. Health and disease, heavily influenced by genomics, but not exclusively. There are other factors that play a role in human disease. And here's sort of a pie chart that shows you all the different genomic variants in a hypo for a hypothetical disease that influence getting a risk for disease. But for most diseases, most diseases, hypertension, diabetes, Alzheimer's, autism, so forth, cardiovascular disease, there's also a substantial contribution of social factors, environment, et cetera. Now, I have mostly spoken about genomics, one, because that's what I do, but two, because we've been very fortunate. The last 30 years of genomics have seen a revolution in the technologies for dissecting and analyzing the left side of this pie chart. But things are changing because there's equally exciting technologies, not that I'm developing or my community, but I know about, that we're getting better and better at being able to measure um, our physiology, our lifestyle, our, our, our um, environmental exposures, and so forth. And so in some ways, genomics was just about looking at genomic information. But another phrase I know many of you have heard about is precision medicine instead of genomic medicine. And all precision medicine is, is a more precise accounting of individual variability. I have spent most of my time talking about individual variability 
with respect to your blueprint, with respect to your genome. And that's laser focused and really important. But I will admit, there's increasing opportunities to new, use new fancy technologies, whether it's a Fitbit or an iPhone or other little mobile sensors that increasingly are becoming available that allow physiology to be measured and monitored in people and increasingly better and better methodologies for measuring how much we exercise, how much we sleep, what, what pollution or what elements that we're being exposed to, and even things that are related to lifestyle and environment like what we eat and what we expose our bodies to. All of that is becoming available because of new technologies that allow you to monitor it. And that is just as exciting as what we've seen in genomics because now we can put the whole pie chart together, the genetic and genomic components of disease, the social, lifestyle, and exposure elements of disease. And that, if you use all that information in the practice of medicine, that's what is meant by precision medicine. Of course, to get there, you need to do a lot of research to figure all of this out and to figure out what all the different contributions are. But the, the time is right. It's incredibly exciting. One, because of the genomics revolution I've told you about in the first three decades of genomics, but also because now, unlike even 10 years ago, there's an amazing amount of data that is going unanalyzed in, in electronic health records. And increasingly, people are recognizing that those health records, which largely were designed for billing purposes, now could basically be used for doing research and getting at many different elements of individual variability. Oh, and you couple that with the new technologies, whether it's a Fitbit or a sensor or whatever, and you could harness a lot of information about individuals and use that to analyze in conjunction with electronic health record data and genomic data and so forth. So if you put these three things together, it sort of sounds like the making of a very exciting research program. And the U.S. Congress recognized this a, a number of years ago and launched a something called the Precision Medicine Initiative and funded NIH to launch this. And the centerpiece of this program is something called the All of Us Research Program, which aims to basically do something almost of sort of the equivalent in terms of scale and audacity as the Human Genome Project, to basically enroll a million people in the United States to be volunteers. And these individuals will agree to be studied over many years, hopefully decades, and they're going to share their genomic data, lifestyle information, biological samples, all this linked to their electronic health records. And the exciting thing is to make that data have appropriate privacy protections built in, but make that data available to scientists, just like all genomic data has been made available to scientists, and hopefully better understand all these different contributions to health and disease. So if you're interested in reading more about all of us, of course, the website, major enrollment going on. I think they're about a fifth of the way through enrolling individuals. It's very exciting. And, um, and the other reason it's very exciting is our country is certainly involved in the, in the biggest of the programs, but shown here is a map of other countries around the world that are doing similar studies and a lot of efforts trying to figure out how to coordinate the analysis and pooling of data to get very large numbers and being able to really take advantage of the world's diversity to be able to study all of these things and really get out a lot of information so that maybe 10 years from now we'll have a much better understanding of what the practice of precision medicine really looks like. And that is a golden opportunity to merge what I've told you about in terms of genomic medicine to these other major contributions to human disease. So keep that in mind. Maybe some of you will sign up, or maybe some of you have signed up to participate in all of us, but it's a trans-NIH effort. We're obviously very excited about all elements of it, particularly the genomic elements that we can provide expertise, and it's something that I think will be a showcase project for the National Institutes of Health. So in the last um, uh, just two or three minutes, I did want to point out again, I give presentations where it seems like the, the PowerPoint slides just flow and it's all very logical and makes it seem so simple, going back to the beginning of the Human Genome Project. Trust me, there's nothing I have described to you today, whether it be the Human Genome Project, the last 16 years since the Genome Project, any of these realities, or even a project like the All of Us Research Program that is linear. All of these things, this is really the roadmap that gets you through these projects. It's lots of twists and turns. Every time you think you know what you're doing, something comes up and you have to sort of make a course correction. It's the nature of biomedical, it's, actually it's the nature of research in general. And everything I've told you is about this constant twists and turns. Um, but what it also means is every once in a while you need to step back, you need to pause, and you need to really strategically plan because you suddenly realize, wow, I've made some incredible accomplishments but the field has faced some new realities, and we need to turn those realities into opportunities. And so we're in the midst of doing this. It's really all about planning for the future. Um, and in particular, it's so important to do this in genomics because I hope you've come to appreciate how fast everything is changing. And when things are changing, you really need to, every once in a while, sort of regroup, sync up, and then rearticulate what the vision is to go forward. 
And so we're in the middle of a, of a, program, of a process that we describe as Genomics 2020. It's basically an attempt to articulate a, vision, a 2020 vision, yes, the pun was intended, uh, for genomics uh, by being ready for the next decade by putting out in 2020 a new strategic plan. Now, strategic planning is something that has been instrumental to genomics from the beginning. The Genome Project was guided by three strategic plans. When the Genome Project ended 16 years ago, we put out a strategic plan that got us through most of the last decade. And then in 2011, we put out a new strategic plan that has really guided us since 2011, particularly embracing genomic medicine and telling you about these key steps I introduced you to that has really led us to the point of now beginning to see genomic medicine in focus. But it was time to sort of come up with a good strategic vision to start the new decade in a very 2020 fashion. Um, and so we kicked off a process in 2017. I'm not going to go through all this except just to illustrate to do this well to engage with the scientific community, the medical community, the various elements of society, and all the various stakeholders that now touch genomics, which is a much bigger group than it even was 16 years ago, I can tell you, you needed a couple years. And so you can see this about a two and a half year process. We are here in this process. We're in the midst of really synthesizing a lot of things that we've heard from engaging a number of groups at a number of events, almost 40 events to date have been held by us to gather input from various stakeholders. And what I would say, it's very exciting, it's really complicated, but we'll, we're going to, I'm sure, articulate this quite well when we publish our new strategic plan in 2020. In, in, the one nuance I just wanted to share with you is, and it's, again, it's, it's success. I, you know, sometimes when you're successful, it brings on grand new challenges, and that's really what we're facing. If you go back in time, 60, remember, NIH has 27 institutes and centers. We're one of 27. You go back only 16 years to the end of the Human Genome Project, and you looked at NIH and you said, who's spending research dollars on genomics? At that point, it was basically 90% of all genomics research dollars were being spent by us. Only about 10% were sprinkled across the rest of NIH. But we've been wildly successful. Everybody's doing genomics now because we've enabled genomics to be done in the Cancer Institute, in the Mental Health Institute, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Di Diabetes Institute, Eye Institute, Deafness Institute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you ask that question, it turns out that about 90% of all genomics research is being funded by other institutes, not by us. We're only funding 10% of genomics research. We're, we're, we're the leaders, but we're only funding 10%. That's because we've been successful in getting genomics infused everywhere in biomedicine. But when you go to write up your strategic vision of what you should be doing, you suddenly realize you're not describing 90% now, you're just describing 10%. And so we really are starting to morph as an institute where we're no longer all about ge all of genomics. We're now really just about the forefront of genomics. We're about that 10% that hopefully will be catalytic and will influence the other 90%. We're still the leaders. We're at the forefront. But the set of things that we're going to be responsible for is going to be a little different next decade because everybody's doing genomics and we need to figure out how to help them even do more efficient work in the genomics research that they do. So and there's lots of ways if you want to dig deeper into our strategic planning process. We have websites and emails. You can contact us. You can even follow us on social media. I'll leave that up. Um, but that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, let me just assure you that the reason this strategic planning process is so important is because, you know, it's that, that, that precious resource that the U.S. Congress gives us every year called a budget. And we want to make sure that budget is maximally impactful and to, because it's not just about us anymore. Now it needs to be maximally impactful for the 90% of the rest of it, genomics research being done by all the other institutes. We want to raise everybody's boat. We want to have a strategic vision for doing it, and that strategic planning process will ensure that we are using our dollars most effectively uh, next decade. So I will stop there. I'm happy to talk about anything you're interested in. Thank you very much.